Mm -hmm. And I think one, um, the URC has recognized that that's an issue and recently applied for and received monies for an infrastructure grant mm -hmm. that allows for building of this network and building of um, infrastructure and partnerships. And Robert will talk a little bit about it in, uh, in about 10, 15 minutes. But mm -hmm. um, what we are doing now is identifying those that are interested in different areas of research and partnering them with community partners as well as academic partners and other researchers and practitioners in the community. So that is one way that in that it's streamlining and w would hopefully help someone like you who is looking at uh, partnering with or identifying those uh, monies that would help you. So it, that is one area that was recognized by the URC as a gap of how do we promote partnerships, how do we sustain the work and get others to work in a more CBPR approach, using the CBPR approach. And in doing that, that infrastructure grant, I think will help guide us into that area more. Okay. Yeah. And we can talk to you again after the presentation. Yeah, one last question. Yes. Um, I was wondering, and making decisions about who makes papers and Right. Trust and believe that your partners would not allow that. I mean, I, I've never found that to be the problem anyway, but there's no way that you could throw your work on me. I have enough work. Um, but I think people really they're they're savvy enough and they understand enough around the table what equality is and, and what things should look like. And if, if it was one-sided, um, whether researchers were doing all the work and we were adding our names on it, that would be noted and someone would say something. Um, or if they were just loafing, to use your word, all their work off on uh, community partners, it would definitely be dealt with. I, it, it'll be noted. It wouldn't happen. <laughs> it wouldn't. Um, and, and again, I think you know one of the advantages of the URC is that we have had this partnership in place oh, wow. for a long time. Um, and I can see some of that uh, creeping in or being an issue if it's a new partnership. That you do want to place, um, we also have detailed um, requirements and for use of data, for presentation of data, for in all of our projects. So we have mechanisms in place and protocols within the URC that we use. Yes? Besides, it seems to me that if you're actually working together with design, you can say, well, this is what I want to do. Right. Yeah, no. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, when we write grants, when we, um, we have writing teams, we have uh, writing teams that are interested in uh, developing a grant, de interested in reporting a specific uh, finding or a you know, research question, um, in going out to conduct a presentation related to that question. So we self-identify and work in smaller teams as well, because if it were the bigger group, nothing would get done either. But many times we're working in groups of four to five that are, have self-identified and as a, having an interest, a clear interest and in wanting to move that project forward. Okay. Yes. I see how the approach has a lot of energy behind it and a lot of focus. I guess my question is how, in addition to providing the specific support for it, So as I mentioned, I'm an assistant professor. I also have other research. Um, and so I have maintained some research that is not CBPR. 
um, and it does not follow that approach. And that is secondary data analysis as well as um, other asthma work that I continue to conduct. It, I want to do CBPR full time, as, but in requirements for tenure, for promotion, I am not able to because I would not be able to publish quickly enough to um, receive funding quickly enough. But in some ways, all of my work comes back to the steering committee. They hear about all of it. Mm -hmm. The, I think what has been most supportive for me as a junior um, investigator has been that I will enter the steering committee um, meetings and I will be asked, what do you need? What do you need for promotion? What do you need for, and Ms. Deloney's here and she has asked as well. Um, and we have, you know, this process of what is needed, what do you need to achieve your promotion, to be successful. So there is this, e uh, the equity is both ways. I feel that the, we all want to work in this way. We've come to an agreement that we will, but there is also an understanding that we need to achieve specific things as academics for promotion and for other. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we're very open about those discussions. I would agree. Yeah. And I think since I've been with the URC, I, I think I've seen three professors tenured. And um, so, yeah, we very much, we, we understand the process and we're very empathetic um, to the work that they have to do outside of CBPR. And I think that's a perfect segue to end this um, because we just want to note one other thing, that there are other viable approaches to conducting research. And these questions that we presented to you here are only relevant if you're trying to do or determine if um, a, a research project is CBPR. So we do um, focus on a conceptual model of community-based participatory research partnerships, and we evaluate ourselves in many ways. Uh, we want to look at the long-term outcomes of the partnership and its effectiveness, so we take that into account. We have mechanisms in place to identify um, continued part participation, engagement, and equity, as well as um, look at intermediate outcomes of the partnership e effectiveness. Um, is shared ownership continuing? Uh, the cohesiveness of the partnership, perceived benefits, and are they outweighing the costs? You know, at what point is a steering committee no longer viable? Is their work not moving forward? And how can we help each other in moving forward? Um, we look at group dynamics and characteristics of the effective partnership, such as shared leadership and participatory decision making and the shared power. We need to make sure that that continues. Um, and we also look at the environment and the contextual factors, such as the socioeconomic factors and previous collaborations and history in the community and the university capacity as well. And this also is where, in looking at how we were moving forward through the URC, we saw that it was important for us to open this process up to connect and network others into um, community partner to build the community partnerships not necessarily in this way those that are signing up for the in, you know as part of the network do not have to practice CBPR I mean they have to be engaged with community partners but we're not overseeing those projects it is building that relationship and introducing others to other partners who have similar interests um, these include uh, academics from MSU, from Wayne State, from other universities, as well as community partners all over Southeast Michigan. So this is, and internally at U of M. So we're trying to promote and facilitate a mechanism for interdisciplinary approaches to um, community-based participatory research. So our setting is specific to Detroit, Michigan, and um, Yolanda will talk a little bit about the setting that we're working in, the history. Okay, just to give you a little um, background about Detroit. Detroit is a city with a rich history that includes major contributions to the civil rights movement, labor organizing, manufacturing, and musical traditions. In recent decades, the city and its residents have faced considerable challenges, including a declining population and tax base. 
Relocation of major employers out of the city and the associate, associated loss of economic resources and community infrastructure. Detroit presently has less than 900,000 residents with almost a third living below the poverty line. And 83% um, of Detroit residents are African American, 8% are white, and 6% are Latino. And I think that's from 2000 census. Yeah. And Detroit has many resources and strengths, including strong social networks, engaging community residents, active faith and community-based organizations, and have faced these challenges with, I'm sorry, and committed health and human service organizations. Though Detroit residents have faced these challenges with strength, determination, and resilience, they have also exerted a toll on their health and well-being. In, in the 1960s, Detroit was one of America's most important cities, a hub of the in industry with a population of almost two million and a skyline to rival that of any U.S. city. Its buildings were monuments to its success and vitality in the first half of the 20th century. And at the start of the 21st century, those same monuments are now ruins. The United Artists Theater, the Whitney Building, the Farwell Building, and the once ravishing Michigan Central Station has been unused since 1988, it looks like someone has literally dropped the bomb on Detroit, leaving behind the ruins of once a great civilization. Detroit's white middle class continues to abandon the city for the suburbs and its downtown high rises is being emptied out. These astounding images which convey both the imperious grandeur of the city's architecture and its genuinely shocking decline preserve a monument that warns us all of the transience of great epochs, epics. <laughs> Excuse me. But Detroit, okay. once our fourth largest city, now on the 11th, and again, I think this is based on 2000 census, um, is slipping rapidly. 